My name is David Giltonen. I am a voice actor, uh, writer, uh, content creator at large, if you will. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm the narrator and the producer of the audiobook for Stay a While and Listen Book to Heaven, Hell, and Secret Cow Levels. So David, talk about how you got involved in this project to begin with. Sure, yeah. Um, so my friend David L. Craddock, uh, he's the author of the book. Um, he reached out to me on uh, the opportunity to work with him on this. Uh, I believe like last time I had him on my podcast when I was still doing my podcast, uh, Rcast, another retro game podcast. And um, yeah, he you know he just basically just asked me. It's like, hey, uh, you know, I know that you're you know that you're getting into voice acting and that this is like something that you're like interested in doing. Um, I'm looking to have someone do like narration for for my book, and so he just kind of asked me to like audition. Um, originally, um, you know, it was like decided from like you know investors and stuff that he was like working with that they weren't going to go with me. Uh, but then I, re uh, you know, but then they reached back out to me like after like a couple of months, and and they were like, actually, we 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 um we we you know we ch we changed our mind and we actually liked your audition, so we're gonna have you like do it anyways. It's like, oh, okay, all right. So, um, yeah. So several months later, I uh, came out with a you know with a book, and uh, definitely a lot of work behind it, but it was, uh, it was a lot of fun to do. So talk about the the audition process. Like when you're auditioning to read for specifically an audiobook, do you just read excerpts from the book, or do you have to do like read something else? It's an excerpt, basically, yeah. So, like, the excerpt um, that Dave had me read uh, was for, uh, it was just from, like, a, like a chapter from, like, the book, like, like, a short chapter from the book. And um, just basically, uh, you know, understand, like, what my sound was and, like, how, like, my cadence was and all that stuff. So, that's basically the uh, audition process, if you will, uh, for that. Uh, pretty much like how any, like, voiceover project, uh, they're going to have you read, like, a segment of whatever it is the thing that you're reading and um, just assess that way. Did you do all this? Because obviously, you know, COVID was happening to stay at home orders. Were you able to do this in the comfort of your own home or did you have to go to some studio or some enclosed area? Yeah, so I was in the middle, actually, of putting together my home studio, basically. So uh, I have a basement. I'm lucky enough to have a basement, basically, which uh, catches like a lot of good sound. So um, I did uh, did the recording there. But uh, since I did the recording for the audiobook, I've been, um, you know, you know I, I've been improving on the uh, audio space and all that to uh, make it sound better for the future, especially since I do have other audiobooks uh, and other voiceover projects uh, lined up in the future for sure. So. so how long does it take to do an audiobook? I mean, obviously it depends on the length of the book, but at the same time, that's got to be like a, like a long days of just reading. And then if you mess up, you have to start the sentence over again, just like your regular VO or how does that work? Sure. Yeah. Uh, it does take a long time. Um, it depends on uh, what the audiobook is, like you know how long the book itself is uh, as well. Um, this is a particularly long book. Um, it is over, I believe it's uh, 28 chapters, and maybe a little like uh, like one over that because there's like some extra stuff in there as well. Um, so yeah, like it, it definitely takes like a while. Um, and uh, as far as like, the process goes. Uh, I'll basically just do like all the you know, all the readings, like make sure I have like my raw audio files, basically that like I'm doing the readings from. If I mess up or flub up on a lie, which certainly happens a lot, which you know again is why it takes like such a long time to. Um, I would just, just you know I just do kind of like a reread of like that line for myself, just to kind of make sure I have that uh, you know at least like one or two just like clean readings of whatever line. If there's like a problematic line I'm reading or something like that, <clears throat> and then from there uh, go into editing mode and. As I'm sure you know, the editing process is uh, the real beast of any sort of project that you take on. So, uh, yeah, so, so just kind of like, you know, figuring out like, you know, like all the cues like I gave myself when doing the recording and uh, just uh, work from there. Basically, just make sure everything's as clean and as fluid as possible. So did you have to edit it too or did you were you able to ship it off to someone else to worry about that? Nope, I am the <laughs> producer and the narrator. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my yeah. God. And then, and, um, so talk about a little bit about your setup in the basement. Do you have, you know, the foam wall pads? What kind of mic do you have? What kind of audio program are you using? Sure, yeah. Uh, so the mic I'm using down in the basement, it's not this mic right here, but uh, it's a Rode NT1. Uh, it's, a, it's a really nice mic. It's a, it's a newer mic that I picked up. Um, I have that set up. I have like a, with like a blanket, like over it just to help like with sound dampening. Uh, it's off in the corner of the basement, like next to my washer and dryer basically. And, um, it's just like a nice little, like kind of alcove that I've kind of carved out for myself for my recording space. Um, so thankfully it does, uh, you know, it like, uh, you know, catches the sound like really well there. And, um, yeah, as far as like the, uh, audio editing software, I use Reaper. Um, I, you know, I've always been a big, big proponent of Reaper. So that's just what I'm used to. And that's what I use. So. So like what what did, I mean obviously you you manage many hats you said you know voiceover content creator you you've also been writing about video games for years mm -hmm. 
Um, what made you decide to get into voice acting? Or has it always been like a passion of yours to do that kind of stuff? Always been a passion of mine, always been in the back of my mind. Um, just something I never, I guess, like seriously decided to pursue until more recently uh, when I decided to end our cast. Um, you know, cause it's been like, uh, you know, it's been like a long journey. I've been doing this for like nine years now, like being involved in the gaming industry in one fashion or another, um, you know, starting off with like my own blog and YouTube channel and then doing, you know, do, do, you know doing, uh, doing Retro Magazine as the managing editor, um, you know, doing that for over three years and then doing art cast after that for four and a half years. So, um, you know, it's been, it's been a long journey kind of like leading up to um, me deciding like, you know what, I'm gonna pursue voice acting, especially like, you know, with COVID kind of happening and, I was, you know, trying to kind of reassess things as far as I would is that, um, you know, I should be like focusing on now. Um, I felt like I kind of like ran my course with the show um, and also just with the way that kind of things are going, because there's a lot of, uh, you know, if you've been paying attention to like, you know, Twitter drama and all that stuff, um, certainly a lot of stuff with my former co-host I had to like reassess. Um, you know, I was trying to give like the show like a fresh start and that didn't like work out because of the podcast network that I went to, uh, like the new podcast network I went to not holding up with their end of the bargain, if you will. So, um, and I was in, I was in the middle of doing the audiobook at that time as well too. So it just felt like, you know what, I'm going to focus on the audiobook. I'm going to focus on voiceover in general. Just, this just seemed like a perfect transition for me to uh, take my career this way. So. How do you go about like auditioning for other work or how do you find other voiceover work where people need talent? Uh, so I'm trying to make use of the connections I have within the gaming industry um, to find some work that way. Uh, also, I've had like a number of people thankfully uh, reach out to me like for potential work and like for um, things that they feel like I would be like good to audition for. So that's what I've been doing. Um, so I've been like, you know, I've been looking for work in that regard, but, um, you know, I've been doing like auditions to like, uh, say like, you know, voice one, two, three, for example, that's like, you know, that's like a pay to play type of service, like where you pay into, um, certain, like, um, a certain like level and you get like a certain like uh, auditions that way. So I've been doing that, uh, been reaching out to various voiceover, uh, coaches and teachers as well. And, uh, they also help with like finding work in that regard too. So. I've uh, been doing that along with like some, you know, writing gigs, you know, some writing gigs here and there within the gaming industry, which I still do. Um, so that's basically how I've been uh, staying above water, if you will, uh, like lately with all that. And then, like, does it help to read the book or uh, like multiple times? Did you have to read the book multiple times or do you just kind of like read it as you're, at, you know, as you're doing VO for the first time? Um, well, when I was doing Stay Wild and Listen Book 2, uh, I, I did give it like a um, kind of like a like a once over read, basically just kind of like uh, acclimate myself to like how it's, you know, how it's supposed to be read and all that just to give myself an idea. And then I did the second read basically as I'm recording very much uh, once I had like an idea like how the book flows and all that. So um, that's basically how I approached it. Um, and I feel like that's that, you know, that works for me in that regard. Uh, I know, like, depending on, like, the book as well, because, like, if it's, like, say, like a, like, a fictional book and they have, like, a you know, multitude of, like, characters they have to play and all that, uh, that's definitely trickier than, like, the type of book I was doing. Um, so, I, like, I would imagine for that type of book, it would be necessary, really, to give it, like, a few reads before you actually do the recording read. Um, just so you have, like, you know, voices in your head as far as, like, you know, who, you know, like, how different characters are, are supposed to sound and all that. So, um, it, it all kind of, like, depends on the project before that particular uh, book uh, since it is kind of like more of like a narration read and like there's just like kind of quotes that I can just basically just use like my own voice just in a different context uh, than like my narration voice um, then it was easy enough for me to to uh, work with that so. in, in like a perfect world what show or book or <clears throat> media show would you want to work on professionally <laughs> uh gosh um like any sort of like uh ip you mean or like any sort of like uh yeah yeah any kind of like of if it's a certain genre or certain netflix show or certain type of cartoon or anything like that gosh i don't know if i could like narrate maybe like the autobiography of bill murray maybe that would be pretty cool <laughs> um i love that guy but um i don't know i mean like yeah, I, I love the whole process of like just kind of reading and like, um, especially when it comes to with like anything like in the gaming realm. Like I love like um, stories, like behind the scenes stories, because uh, that's what I would do a lot of time with uh, the guests who I had on for our cast back, you know, you know, back when I was doing that. Uh, I love the whole conversation. I love the whole like digging into like the history of things like that. So um, I guess anything with that. Um, also, like anything political as well, since I've become like more like politically active uh, lately, and like that's something I would be very interested in, like you know, reading up, uh, you know, doing like uh, working within the cons uh, confines of 
uh, within some sort of like political work or like, you know, if I was reading on like, um, you know, about like the Black Panthers or something like that, uh, be like pretty cool like to, uh, to go into the, you know, go digging into that, uh, working within that uh, in some way. I want to go back a little bit because you mentioned like, you know, you were casted to do the audiobook and you did the audiobook and you also produced it, which meant that you had your own studio set up and had to edit it. Like what else is in, in, in involved in that aside from the editing and the final delivery when you're producing it as well as not as aside from just like getting hired on to do the voice and being like doing it, then like kind of that's it, you know? I mean, most of the time is like with uh, getting the readings right and, you know, the editing process is obviously the bulk of it. Um, yeah, like aside from that too, there's like, you know, just like some back and forth correspondence with uh, Dave, you know, with, um, with, with Dave Craddock, uh, just to make sure that, um, uh, you know, I had like the readings that he wanted me to do. Cause um, you know, obviously there's like the chapters, which I knew I had to do like the readings for, but also to kind of make sure it's like, oh, do you need me to read like this part of the book or this part of the book kind of thing. And um, is there like a particular thing that you want me to add onto it as well? Cause there's like certain things that's not in the book that I had to add for the sake of audible, like when you're submitting it to them. Um, you know, that they need, like, for, you know, to kind of say, like, narrated by David Giltonen, for example, like, just kind of, like, have that part in there. Um, so, you know, they, like, they need that for, like, for, for their sake. But um, aside from that, like, that's basically what it is. It's just, um, you know, doing, like, the once over for the read uh, for me. Um, it's kind of, like, you know, to, to acclimate myself to the book itself, do the recording, do the editing. And while do the editing, you know, just, just going back and forth with the author uh, to, you know, make sure that we have everything that we need put it all together, submit it to Audible, and leave it in Amazon's hands, and hopefully they, they do good by it, <laughs> basically. You know, it's funny, because I, I helped kickstart that book originally, and I, I've been reading it very slowly, but after listening to your excerpt, I'm like now going back and reading it, I just, I'm just i just reading it in your voice now. <laughs> so, it's like, okay, I mean, that makes sense, right? You hear it vocalized, you're like, I guess what it sounds, you know? It's going to haunt your dreams with my voice. <laughs> so, so it's funny, right? Yeah, that smooth, buttery voice made for radio. <laughs> well thank so, you very much I, I do appreciate that <laughs> so david like what uh, what what are you working on next what can you talk about that you'll be involved in next that we can keep an eye out for uh sure um yeah i don't think it's like uh made to be a big secret or anything so i guess i can uh, mention mention to you here uh scoop like you're right here uh so uh, i am going to be working on another audiobook with dave craddock uh, for his book rk perfect um, so I recently submitted uh, an excerpt recording to him uh, for the uh, there's like a Mortal Kombat part in there, which is really cool. Um, that I wanted to you know to do the reading for for the uh, you know, sample and everything. So uh, just waiting to hear back from him on uh, the reading with that. Make sure everything is uh, you know is a tip top shape with that. Uh, since I you know again kind of you know made improvements with the uh, recording space and um, yeah you know just kind of waiting to hear about that. Uh, aside from that, I have like other things in the oven that. Um, can't really go into detail on but um yeah just keeping busy and trying to make 2021 uh worthwhile so <laughs> i mean we've always like retro stuff has always been like i want to say like it's been popular but like why particularly these last two years with documentaries like insert coin david credits books high score like why do you think it's kind of making a huge resurgence now i think because we're at that age now like where we have people who grew up with all that stuff are basically able and willing to make cool content that's based on the stuff that we grew up on. I mean, you see that too with Rob, uh, Rob McCollum's uh, doc documentaries as well. Um, you know, like, he, like he's done a great job like with like a uh, box art, for example, the, you, know, the, the, you know, it's a great documentary on like just like box art and like games. It's like, we, you know, I think like all of us like who kind of grew up in our generation remember going to like, you know, Blockbuster to like a game store or whatever and just looking through like the box art and like we're like deciding like which game that we want to pick up based on like how cool the box art is like even if the game itself like looks nothing like it or whatever um so like just like things like that like where um you know it's just like people now kind of like you know having grown up uh with that stuff are now at an age where now they, they can create cool stuff that's like about it or around it in, in some way um this is like with a like game, game development like where you see a lot a lot of like pixel art game that you know that's coming out and uh, now we're even seeing like more games that are like are uh, kind of like based on like the old, old like old 3D games as well, like you know Banjo Kazooie type, type games or whatever. Um, just trying to make like games like that with like y y ukulele, for example, is a, you know it's a very good example of that. We're seeing games like that with uh, you know people who grew up in that era uh, also coming out with games like that. So I think it's just all kind of like uh, with the creators and what they grew up with and what they're basing their work off of. It can make me make us feel so old because we have a, a friend and coworker Donovan and he. We were we were at E3 once, and he said something. I forget the sentence exactly, but he was like, "Oh, it's like the retro GameCube," and I was like, "It's only 15 years old. It's not that, <laughs> not that old." <laughs> just, just, you no. look at the and you're like, "Oh my God, it's 
it's all over again. Like, I mean, people don't know who Chris Farley is. You know, people don't. I've never yeah. played. You know, the su- the super. You know, if it's not on Nintendo Switch, they probably kids have probably haven't played it yet. You know, so it's. And that's the thing too, with like the Nintendo Switch has become a really good retro console onto itself. Really, there's so many good retro games that, that come out on there, especially on the SNK side of things. So it's uh, it's really awesome to see all that, especially like Neo Geo Pocket Color games coming out there. Like hell yeah, you know I'll just take it all, just buy it all right there. <laughs> you know, it's so good. Yeah, games like like uh, like arcade games like Metal Slug are on there, and like just a lot of things that maybe kids would have would have not been able to experience the arcades because they were kind of dying out in the 2000s. It was really hard to find. Yeah. And then like two thousand, I remember two thousand three was a for arcade games specifically. Like they shut down the arcade at the mall, and it was really hard to find. But at that point, at that point, everything was on the PlayStation. Like any any arcade, most of the arcade games that I liked were on the PlayStation. A lot of the fighting games. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's just funny how uh, time a time makes fools of us all. I guess I'm yeah. trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> it was like around that time with like you know with like the ps1 era and saturn and all that stuff like when um you know you had like the arcades kind of like dying out just because people realized that they could basically buy the games that like arcade perfect ports of them if you will without having to like keep putting in quarters and like pay to play in that sense just like pay that that one lump sum and now you just own it and play it as much as you want without any continues or anything so um yeah and like that's that's kind of like what, what happened with that but then um you know i saw like arcades kind of like having like a resurgence with like uh, barcades if you will um, but it feels like COVID's kind of like put like a real kind of like dent in all that as well. So it's kind of I'm really curious to see what the future of arcades looks like. Cause um, you know, there, there's nothing quite like that experience of like, you know, going to an arcade and you just like, just pop in a quarter of like cards really in a lot of cases, uh, you know, nowadays. Um, and uh, just kind of playing against like people like in that environment, like there's, there's just nothing else like it. And David, where can people go to contact you if they're interested in your services, whether it be writing or voice work? Sure. Uh, so there's my website, logicallydashing.com, uh, where you can find me there. You can contact me there as well, find my work and stuff. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, which is like my main social media home, at The Guilty Man. Uh, same thing for Instagram, at The Guilty Man.